For our story, we have the case of Bilal Abdul Karim versus Gina Sherry Haspel, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. So Mr. Karim has been in overseas, and a number of times he has been remarkably close to places where bombs are being deployed, uh, apparently aerially. And he's suspected that maybe the U.S. government is trying to kill him. And he'd like to know if the U.S. government is trying to kill him. And the U.S. government went to court and said, you can't know whether or not we're trying to kill you because that comprises a military secret. And therefore, it's something we're not going to tell you about. And the district court said, you're right, it's a military secret. And therefore, it's not something we're going to tell you about. We're not going to tell you whether or not they're trying to kill you or not. Sucks to be you. So we're going to read this decision and see what the district court has to say. What constitutional right is more essential than the right to due process before the government may take a life? While the answer may be none, federal courts possess limited authority to resolve questions presented in a lawsuit, even where they allege to involve constitutional rights. This is such a case. Despite the serious nature of plaintiff's allegations, this court must dismiss the action pursuant to the government's invocation of state secret privilege. Plaintiff Bilal Abdul Karim is a jewel journalist specializing in reporting on terrorism and conflict in the Middle East. Mr. Karim has been the victim or near victim of at least five aerial bombings while in Syria. Accordingly, he believes his name is on a list of individuals the United States has determined are terrorists and may be killed, the so-called kill list. Mr. Kareem sues the director of the CIA, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Attorney General, and the Director of the National Intelligence, all in their official capacities, as well as Department of Justice. The court previously granted in part and denied in part defendant's motion for dis to dismiss for lack of standing and failure to state a claim. Defendant now moves to dismiss Mr. Kareem's remaining claims pursuant to state secrets privilege, arguing the facts necessary for Mr. Kareem to establish his prima facie case or for defendants to defend against this claim are classified, and without disclosure of the facts, the case cannot proceed. Having carefully considered the issues, the court agrees. So if the, court, if the government is trying to kill you, they're not going to let you know. The facts are described in detail in the decision on defendant's first motion to dismiss, so they'll be repeated here only as relevant. After the court permitted three of Mr. Kareem's claims to proceed, the parties discussed potential pretrial resolution. Despite two months of discussions, the parties were unable to resolve. Mr. Kareem then asked to begin discovery, and defendants notified the court they were considering a second motion to dismiss based on state secrets. After considerable time, due to multiple motions for extension of time and excessive government shutdown, defendant filed a motion to dismiss pertinent to state secret privilege. The motion is ripe for review. The United States is privileged to refuse to disclose information required in litigation when there is reasonable danger. The disclosure will expose military matters which, in the interest of national security, shall not be divulged. The privilege is not likely invoked, but courts should accord the utmost deference to executive actions of privilege upon grounds of military or diplomatic secrets. Quoting United States v. Nixon, the case we just read earlier, Review of invocation of state secrets privilege occupies three steps. First, there must be a formal claim of privilege lodged by the head of the department, which has control after actual personal consideration by that officer. Next, the court must evaluate the basis of the privilege without forcing a disclosure of the very thing the privilege is designed to protect. The sensitivity of the privilege and the information at issue requires the court to review declarations submitted, both publicly and in camera, which is to say in chambers, to determine if the privilege is properly invoked. The court must satisfy all from all the evidence and circumstances and from implications of the questions in a setting which is asked, the responsive answer to the questions or an explanation of why it cannot be answered might be dangerous because injurious disclosure could result. If a court is so satisfied, the claim of privilege will be accepted without forward disclosure. It's not necessary for the court to examine actual evidence made in this determination. As we read in the U.S. v. Nixon case, even in-camera inspection of state secrets is not permitted, and that's exactly what they're talking about here. Finally, once the court finds that there's a reasonable danger that disclosure of information will expose military matters or harm national security, the court must determine where the case may proceed without information of whether it is so entwined in the matter that the case cannot be litigated and dismissal is necessary. The government has satisfied the three procedural requirements for invoking the state secret privilege. First, the privilege was asserted by the United States government itself and not a third party. Second, the claim of privilege was made through a formal declaration by the heads of the agencies responsible. The acting Secretary of Defense and the then the Director of National Intelligence submitted formal declarations, both public and in-camera ex parte explanations, explaining that they're individuals responsible for the relevant information and invoking the privilege. Third, the acting Secretary and Director both declared they personally reviewed the information and determined state secret privilege was warranted. When properly invoked, the state secret privilege is absolute. 
No competing public or private interest can advance to compel disclosure of information found to be protected by a claim of privilege. Due to the absolute nature of the privilege, a court must not merely unthinkingly ratify the executive's assertion of absolute privilege, lest it inappropriately abandon its important judicial role. The government is required to show disclosure of the information poses a reasonable danger to secrets of state. Other claims of privilege can also be overcome when necessarily presented by the requesting party outweighs the privilege, but such is not the case where state secrets would be disclosed. Instead, the degree of necessity determines how far the court should probe in satisfying itself for the occasion invoking the privilege is appropriate. Where there's a strong showing of necessity, the claim of privilege should not be likely accepted, but even the most compelling necessity cannot overclaim the claim of privilege if the court is ultimately satisfied military secrets are at stake. Therefore, the critical feature of the inquiry in evaluating the claim of privilege is not a balancing of the ultimate interests at stake. The balance has already been struck. Rather, the determination is showing whether the showing of harm might be reasonably seen to flow from the disclosure is adequate, in a given case to tr trigger the absolute right to withhold the information sought in the case. So the president may not have an absolute right to keep his secrets secret, but the CIA does just in case you wanted to know. Mr. Cream claim involves allegations that the United States targeted an American citizen for lethal action in a foreign country without due process of law. His need for information to prove his claims is unquestionably strong. Thus, close examination of the government's assertions is warranted. The government invokes the state secret privilege to protect the existence and operational details of alleged military and intelligence activities directed at combating the terrorist threat to the United States. Mr. Kareem specifically requests discovery into whether or not the United States has in fact targeted Kareem for lethal force, and if so, the facts on which the government relies, what process the government used to designate him, and if it continues to designate him, and whether or not the United States attempted to kill Kareem in the airstrikes alleged. Based on a review of the public and classified declarations, the court finds the information Mr. Kareem asked for constitutes privileged state secrets because there's a reasonable danger that disclosing such information would endanger national security. Detailed statements underscore the disclosure of privileged information and the mean source and methods of intelligence gathering in the context of the case would undermine the government's intelligence capabilities and compromise national security. The government explains the disclosure of whether an individual is being targeted for lethal action would permit the individual to alter his behavior to evade attack or could capture and could risk intelligence sources and methods if an individual learns he's under surveillance. I'm not quite sure how that's true when it comes to like aerial surveillance. I'm not quite sure like knowing that if I knew for an active fact that if I was overseas, I was being surveilled, I'm not quite sure what I could do to prevent that from happening because they're surveilling me from air and satellites and whatever. So I'm not sure what I could do, but okay. Acting Secretary Shannon states in his public declaration that disclosing classified information about targeted airstrikes could hinder the United States military operations and disclosing whether the United States possesses information about a particular individual could alert them, allowing them to prevent further collection and risk disclosure of intelligence sources and method, thereby thwarting intelligence officers. I, I'm not quite sure how it dis risks disclosure of intelligence sources and methods to say, yes, your name is on the list. Uh, it might preclude further collection because they might not want to go overseas anymore, but, you know, okay. No, I could see a way. I oh, could yeah? see a way. So, like, yeah. So, um, if I know that there's only one reason why the U.S. government would want me dead, and then I find out that the U.S. government wants me dead, then I know that they are aware of my activities so either there is a mole or an informant or that project, I'll call it, uh, has like cats out of the bag. So then I can then go and warn any co-conspirators that I have, like the U.S. knows what we're up to. Flee. Okay. And yeah. All right. I, 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 can, I can see a potential context where that could come up. I understand your point. Yeah. But... I, I do love the, well, love is exactly the wrong word. I do, uh, what's the word I want? Hate deeply the fact that this is a United States citizen who's apparently being targeted by our government, who like five or six times bombs have gone off near him from aerial bombs. I mean, you know, the fifth the fifth time would be a clue to me that maybe someone doesn't like me. That might be, that might be a clue to me that something might be up. So, yeah, I, I yeah. And then I sue them and they say, we're not going to tell you if you're on a list because that's a state secret. And the state says, go away. Well, could you imagine if um, 
they confirmed if you were not on a list, but then said, oh, we can't tell you if you're on a list if you were on a list. So like he might not be yeah, on a list. That's fair. But if they confirm that he's not, then that means just anybody gets to sue and says, am I on the list? And then whoever they don't answer, they go, ah, I'm on the list. Right, exactly. So that that is an extremely fair point. I, I would potentially differentiate when it comes to United States citizens versus random people in the world versus we're not we're not going to tell you we're not going to the CIA does love the we're not going to confirm or deny because even denial would tell you something so they do love that yeah the glomar we can neither confirm or deny exactly correct thank you evil triple they do love that but i don't know when it comes to us citizens i don't know should here here's the operative question like should any us citizen's name be on the we're going to kill you list i guess if you're in active combat against the united states maybe but then again, you're probably not petitioning the courts to find out if you're on a list. So I don't know. But your point is well taken. If they if they deny people are on the list and then other people ask and say, we're not going to tell you, it would tell you that you're on the list. Yes, your point is well taken. Director Coates similarly declared that disclosing whether the United States targets terrorists aboard with lethal force could reasonably be expected to cause harm to national security by alerting terrorists and terrorist organizations to specific means the U.S. government is using or is not using to combat terrorism. I think everyone's pretty familiar with the drone program at this point. I think everyone's got the memo. Confirming or denying whether Mr. Kareem has been designated for use or lethal force could permit him to evade capture or further action by the United States. Are, are we trying to are we trying to capture him? Like what? Disclosing whether the United States maintained information about Mr. Kareem could reveal sources and methods by which the information was obtained. That's fair. That's fair. If the only way they got the information is from people who are being monitored for very legitimate reasons. That's potentially a fair point. Uh, compromising the safety and effectiveness. Mr. Cream raises four points against allowing the privilege to apply. First, he argues the constitutional right at issue, his right of due process before the United States can take his life, is so paramount as to make the state privilege inapplicable. Not the worst argument I've ever heard. Second, he asked the court to consider alternative methods of prote protecting information, such as the use of the Classified Information Procedures Act to ensure the classified information is not disclosed outside cleared counsel and the court. So incidentally, there are ways for the court to consider classified information so that it can consider things when these cases come up. So that the judges don't have to be specifically cleared so they can, can see the classified stuff. So Congress thought about that and has written laws that effect. Third, Mr. Cream challenges the assertion that all the information remains privileged because the United States has previously disclosed that U.S. citizens were targeted with lethal action. Finally, he differentiates his request for ad hoc relief, review of the alleged decision to target him with lethal force with prior state privileges cases which requested post hoc relief, challenges to action which could not be further prevented or, or undone. Mr. Cream's first objection focuses on the significance of the right at issue, his right of due process, evidence and argument for the United States can take his life. But the state secret privilege is absolute. Hmm. That's troubling. Invocation of the privilege has serious potential to defeat worthy claims of violations of rights that would otherwise be proved. It's for this reason the privilege is not to be lightly invoked. And incidentally, while I'm thinking about it, when it comes to attorney-client privilege, there is a well-worn exception. I'm pretty confident it is in every state that if you know that your client is about to, like, kill someone, you can disclose that. So even attorney-client privilege does not extend to my client is about to kill somebody. I can call, in fact, I have to call the police and inform them of this. So just saying that the government has a wider privilege than I do. So that's a thing. Man. The government did not rush to claim state secrets here, although it warned state secrets were at issue. It only filed the instant motion when the court first denied its original motion. The court finds the government has not invoked the privilege lightly, but has instead engaged in months of consideration before filing its motion, supported by reasoned declarations from heads of agencies responsible. Nonetheless, the significance of the allegations requires the court to take a thorough and questioning look at the reasons for invoking the privilege, but it does not erase the privilege altogether, or in any respect whatsoever, apparently, if it's absolute, one would think. While no court has previously addressed the state secret privilege in the context of a targeted killing, courts have addressed the privilege in cases involving other constitutional claims. Next, Mr. Kareem probes the limits of the state secret privilege and likens his predicament to a criminal trial. Based on the analogy he requests, the court institutes the CIPA rules for to protect privilege information rather than excluding it altogether. In a criminal trial, the government may not withhold information that would be material to the defense even if it's a privileged state secret. To do so would deprive the defendant of liberty without due process. The United States may either proceed with the indictment and disclose the information or forego prosecution. 
However, the state, however, the Supreme Court has held when the government is not the movement in the civil case, the rationale in criminal cases is not applicable. Fair. It's different in civil versus criminal. Yep. Mr. Cream specifically equates his situation with a criminal capital case, which extra procedural protections are provided the defendant to ensure the punishment is not meted out arbitrarily or capriciously. He argues before a criminal defendant may be subject to capital punishment, he has the opportunity to review and potentially dispute a fulsome record of allegations and considerations that will be used against him. He asks this court for the same protection because he fears the United States military will kill him. Were the United States to choose to prosecute Mr. Kareem for his alleged involvement in ter terrorist activities, the government would be required to disclose with relevant protections any classified information that would be material. But Mr. Kareem is not a criminal defendant, is a plaintiff in a civil suit against the United States, which renders the secret privilege absolute after it's properly asserted. I, 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 would, I would note that by the court's own logic in describing this as absolute, it presumably would apply if the CIA was trying to kill a United States citizen who was inside the country at the time. Like, the way this is written, one would imagine that if the, if the CIA kicks down my door and shoots me, but I know about it in advance, that I still can't get access to that information. So, like, I'm just plumb out of luck if the CIA chooses to commit a covert op against me, even though I'm a United States citizen. That somehow troubles me on several levels, since it can obviously be used to take out people who are just mere political dissidents. I don't know what Mr. Cream's issues are. I don't know whether or not he's involved in terrorism or not, but this is a little unsettling to me because I don't want the U.S. government to just kill me for the hell of it. Third, Mr. Cream challenges the legitimacy of the privilege because the United States has previously disclosed the existence of the kill list and indicated United States citizens has been on the list. Quoting, President Barack Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder have admitted the United States targeted and killed Anwar al aku a terrorist who was a key leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, who I suppose was a U.S. citizen at the time. Mr. Kareem challenges the legitimacy of invoking the state secret privilege here because the United States previously determined its security interests allowed the disclosure of a name on the kill list. Contrary to Mr. Kareem's argument, the D.C. Circuit has already found the government has not stopped, which is to say barred, from concluding in one case the disclosure is permitted and while in another case not. The court holds that a previous U.S. disclosure that an individual has been targeted does not mean the U.S has waived its right as to a state secret to refuse to disclose the who, what, why, and how it might identify future targets. So tactical, if they're after you, I guess you are also similarly out of luck. So, yay. Well, I think, so CIA deals only with foreign stuff. They're not supposed to operate um, no, within not, the U.S. They're not supposed to, no. No, that's true. They're not supposed to operate within the U.S. I agree. Neither is and the, you're the, having <laughs> some doubts over whether they have sufficient oversight to prevent that from ever happening. The, the, the NSA is also not chartered for domestic surveillance. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm having doubts. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, I suppose the CIA could call up one of its friends in another intelligence agency and have them come over here and shoot me, you know, as a trade. So there's that. So the CIA could plot to kill me by having whatever the CIA equivalent of, I don't know, pick your country of choice, come over here. Ukraine, maybe. The Ukrainian CIA come over here and shoot me. And then they'll call it like interagency cooperation. And diplomacy, too. It's military and, and diplomacy. Got, the bat. So we got two we got two exceptions to the uh, to USV Dixon there. It's both diplomatic and military at the same time. Excellent. I feel assured. Finally, Mr. Cream argues the perspective nature of his case differentiates his dilemma from previous cases dealing with state secret privilege. He maintains that none of the cases involved in prosecution of a U.S. citizen or any action analogous to prosecution. In this assertion, he is correct. He is a U.S. citizen voluntarily in Syria reporting on fighting by insurgents and alleged target by the United States without success so far. However, the applicability of state secret privilege has been constantly recognized in civil litigation against the United States even a plaintiff was allegedly violating constitutional rights, which is exactly what the instant lawsuit is, entails. Yes, the U.S. government can violate your constitutional rights as long as it's state secrets. Great. The court understands the difference between this and prior cases, but the similarities are controlling and require the same conclusion. A court does not merely ratify the government's assertion of privilege willy-nilly, which I suppose is good for the court because then they won't come after you, I guess. So there's that. 
This court has reviewed declarations submitted by the government and carefully considered Mr. Kareem's claims and need for documentations, as well as the reason behind the privilege. Consistent thereto, the court finds state secret privilege bars disclosure of required information to Mr. Kareem because disclosure would present a reasonable danger to national security. There's still a question as whether the unavailability of the requested information is fatal to the complaint. Whether it's fatal to Mr. Kareem is no longer a question. Ha ha ha. A court must dismiss the case in which a privilege of state secrets is sustained, where disclosure is necessary for the plan to make its prime official case, disclosure is necessary for the defendant to defend itself, or further litigation will present an unjustified risk. The United States focuses on Mr. Cream's prime official case, arguing Mr. Cream cannot establish its standing to sue without the information. The court agrees and notes all three reasons justify dismissal. Because there's no feasible, feasible way to litigate the alleged liability without creating an unjustified risk of divulging state secrets, the case must be dismissed. The claims and possible defenses are so infused with state secrets that the risk disclosing them is both apparent and inevitable. To prove his prima facie case, Mr. Cream must be able to show he was in fact targeted by the United States with lethal force. The court previously found Mr. Cream's alleged facts sufficient, if proven, to survive a motion to dismiss, but having now had the government is not required to disclose whether Mr. Cream has been targeted as alleged, it's impossible for Mr. Cream to obtain the information necessary to provide, prove his claims. They're all just coincidental so far. Lots of coincidences. Without access to the privileged information, Mr. Cream is unable to establish whether he was targeted by lethal force or what information was considered in reaching the alleged decision to target him. Mr. Cream is incapable of demonstrating he sustained a violation of his constitutional rights without the withheld information. That's cute. <laughs> wow. He is alleged but ultimately cannot show a concrete injury amounting to either specific present objective harm or threat of specific future harm. The several previous attempts to bomb him apparently do not qualify. In this instance, which is relevant information solely in the control of the United States and is protected by state secrets, Mr. Cream is left with no method to obtain to pursue its case, which therefore must be dismissed. The same analysis applies to the government's ability to defend itself. When a plaintiff's prima facie case and defendant's defenses are not affected by state secret, the court must still dismiss if any attempt to proceed will threaten state secrets. In that circumstance, the risk of disclosure alone leads to dismissal. The analysis applies here. The totality of issues to be litigated surrounds the alleged decision to target Mr. Cream, but all such information is privileged in the state secrets and will not be disclosed by the United States. With no hope of a complete record and adversarial deployment of the relevant issue, the court cannot even begin the inquiry. The complaint must be dismissed. For the foregoing reason, the court will dis grant the motion to dismiss. So that is the story of Mr. Kareem and the CIA. So... I guess the operative lessons here are that uh, state secret privilege is absolute. And so that ties in very nicely with our discussion from USV Nixon about uh, some of these privileges. So diplomatic privilege and military privilege are currently held as absolute. So I, that will help Trump in his case. But more to the point in the instant issue for Mr. Kareem, I guess stay out of Syria is all you can do because, yeah, it seems like the U.S. government may have a thing for you. And if You've already been bombed five times. Maybe it's time to not do that anymore. I, I, I have no other advice for you because apparently there's no redress in the courts to be had. So uh, good luck, sir. I hope all is well. I've got nothing more to say about that.